before we move into Knight's Quest, we are going to step a little bit into the Bloodline storyline. I'll be dividing this up into two episodes as there are five issues that make up Batman's contribution or the Batman line's contribution to the story. And I do need to give a little bit of setup. First off, what is Bloodlines? Well, one of the things that came up in comics in the 80s and 90s was for annual issues of various books to do some sort of crossover or event. These events would be limited to those annuals with generally minimal spillover into the main stories of those books. Sometimes they are thematic without a significant narrative through line. Uh, for example, the year following Bloodlines, we have uh, an extension of a selection of Elseworld storylines, each issue having an Elseworld story focusing on an alternate universe version of that character. In the case of Bloodlines, the concept of the storyline was a way to introduce a whole bunch of new characters to the DCU. The premise is that a group of alien parasites uh, land on Earth and seek to feed on humans with some humans who have latent metagenes. The, so the DC Universe explanation for why some heroes are just born with powers, like Black Canary, end up surviving and having their powers activated by these attacks. Each annual would then have these new characters teaming up with the relevant hero as something of an introduction with the character, theoretically, becoming a part of the larger DCU afterwards. Suffice it to say, a lot of these characters struggle to find appearances outside of this event. So as part of my reviewing these, I'm going to discuss also these characters and whether I think they deserved a better shake or could have otherwise fit into the larger universe in some manner or another maybe as a recurring supporting character. So this installment, I'll be covering Batman Shadow of the Bat Annual number one and Batman Annual number 17. The Shadow of the Bat Annual is written by Alan Grant with pencils by Trevor Van Eden. Um, I think it's such pronounced, it's a double E. Uh, inks by Dick Giordano and lettering by Tim Harkins. The Batman Annual is written by Doug Mensch with art by Eduardo Barretts, lettering by Albert de Guzman and is edited by Jordan B. Gorfinkel and the legendary Denny O'Neill, and both are colored by the also legendary Adrian Roy. Shadow of the Bat Annual opens on a dive bar where a lady is chatting up a blonde man with long hair and an equally long face. The man lures her into an alley, mainly through his nervousness, and then turns into a horse-faced monster and kills her. Elsewhere, Batman, it's not clear at this point if it's Bruce or John Paul, is facing a man with visor sunglasses and has a woman at knife point. However, all is not quite as it seems, as the two are boyfriend and girlfriend, and they're trying to skip out with the gang boss's money, or their gang boss's money, and they're doing this as a ruse, so at least one of them can get away. That man isn't fooled, and offers to let him go, provided he points them towards his boss, and then steals the guy's shades. Meanwhile, the monster takes the body of the dead woman to an island, and dumps her in a dark bunker where they appear to be holding several live people prisoner. This leads to our new character, a blonde guy in mirror shades wearing a leather jacket with big F off stars on the shoulders and a US shield t-shirt. We don't get his name really over the course of the series, but he'll get a code name of Joe Public later when we encounter them again. So I'll just go with that. He has an internal monologue that feels like it would fit with an older anarchy, like if anarchy decided to dress patriotically. The guy is preparing to move in on a drug deal on a boat when Batman shows up in disguise. The boss responsible for all of this is a guy named Happy Jack, a gangster with dwarfism. Batman and Joe Public burst in on Jack at the same time, which actually distracts Batman. <coughs> What the fuck are you doing here? Allowing Happy Jack to zap him with a ray gun and get away. However, Jack's getaway is not clean. On his way out, the monster grabs the guy with the drugs, causing him to drop the briefcase, though Jack continues to flee for obvious reasons, though he plans to come back later. Sheesh, I moved to Gotham to get away from this crap. We are then reintroduced to the character of Pagan. She previously appeared in an issue of Shadow of the Bat, uh, and we see her beating up a whole gang as Batman arrives, after which we get a recap of her origin. 
she's basically Cynthia Rothrock in a swimsuit. And then that's actually the problem with her costume there is it's because it's really not great. It's a swimsuit. That's it. Not an athletic leotard, just a swimsuit. My existing complaints about Huntress's outfit all stand here with the lack of knee and elbow protection. And this is all aggravated by the fact that the actual torso of the costume is absolutely unprotected, complete with a, with a cleavage window. I mean, Wonder Woman can get away with a swimsuit inspired costume because she's a demigod and she's borderline invulnerable. Power Girl can, from a practicality standpoint, get away with a boob window because she's a Kryptonian. She is faster than a speeding billet, leaps fall tall buildings with a um, single bound if she's not flying outright, and is stronger than a locomotive. Pagan is just an ordinary human. Just like Batman, and Batman wears body armor. In any case, Batman is investigating a bunch of murders caused by that monster, though he doesn't know that yet. And he offers to team up with Pagan on this one, and she accepts. At the Beast's Lair, the prisoners try to jump the monster when it returns with another victim without success. Batman and Pagan's investigation leads them to the body of Happy Jack's goon, who he apparently didn't take back to his lair, their lair. A block away, Joe Public and Happy Jack also find the case and are about to fight over it, at which point Jack pulls his ray gun and Joe Public spills his backstory. Joe was a PE teacher at Gotham High. One of his students took ecstasy supplied by Jack and got a heart attack and died, so Joe decided to go vigilante. Happy Jack is about to go kill Joe Public when all of a sudden... The monster grabs both of them and flies off, and Batman and Pagan see this, with Batman grabbing a hang glider while Pagan follows by, by boat. Joe Public gets stung by the monster's internal mandible before it f uh, flies off to intercept Batman. Batman and Pagan both try to fight the monster without success, and they flee with Joe Public, who is unconscious, through an air duct, only to end up inside the monster's bunker slash larder. The villain then enters in their humanoid form and explains their plan to them. Capture humans, hold them here to eat. At this point, Joe Public's new powers activate and he draws strength from everyone in the room, literally allowing him to drive the monster off. Gives a whole new meaning to that expression from anime of lend me your strength. Afterwards, Joe Public speculates that maybe he's not cut out for the superhero thing before returning to the city. Spoilers, or not really, we'll see him again in Night Quest. Batman Annual 17 opens with one of the monsters, this time a woman, and this one actually has a name, Angon, attacking a guy in an alley. We quickly go to Commissioner Gordon and Harvey Bullock to start discussing the string of killings, to Gordon telling Batman 2, clearly Batman 2, about this at the Bat Signal. Um, it's, part of what makes it clear is they reference Batman's recovery from the beating, meaning the uh, attack by Bane. However, Bane is still in circulation at this point by the fact that Bat that John Paul is in the standard Batman costume, so hence Batman 2. Batman 2 very quickly finds Angon and tries to fight him, but is only really able to distract her enough that her intended meal is able to escape before John Paul has to flee himself. Jeez, Bruce never mentioned alien invasions when he was talking about me taking over the job. John Paul, somewhat shaken from his first close encounter of the third kind, which means I guess the previous issue had to have been Bruce, returns to Commissioner Gordon and lets him know that GCPD is not equipped to handle this monster, which is accurate. He doesn't mention bringing in Star Labs, which probably would be the, the next wisest course, but hey. We then go to a squad of GCPD SWAT, a hive of toxic masculinity, where we see a whole lot of racist insults being made against the one Korean guy on the squad, Kelvin Mao, <clears throat> by a white guy named McCain. These aren't even microaggressions, they're just, they're just aggressions. The only person who stands up for Mao is the one black guy on the squad, who I don't think gets a name, just the nickname of Jukes. 
Honestly, James Gordon might be trying to clean things up from the top, but it's clear that below him in the G, at least as far as the GCPD is concerned, all Gotham cops are bastards. In the Batcave, John Paul tries to put together a plan, but without ever having been prepared for this part of the job, and without, to my knowledge, any contacts with the JLA or Star Labs that he can use. Back at his apartment, Mao considers resignation for a moment, and only for a moment. Ang on attacks again, this time in the warehouse district. The Night Watchman reports it in, and SWAT beats Batman 2 there, and the squad is themselves surprised to see their first alien. Like a proper XCOM rookie, McCain freezes and panics, which allows the monster to kill the Watchman and then McCain. By the time Batman arrives, everyone on the squad is dead except for Mao, who is himself in a bad way. As Gordon and Bullock commiserate over the condolence letters that Gordon is going to have to write, and while Angon is going after another mark in a bar, Mao is being put, being put in a high-tech full-body cast. The doctors check in on Mao and then discover that his cast is gone, and instead he's covered by some sort of carapace. And then the power goes out, and when it returns, Mao is also gone. Outside, Mao is running along rooftops, unintentionally experimenting with his new powers in the process. He returns home and realizes with his much more inhuman appearance, he probably should hide. So he clears an entrance to a disused subway tunnel with some... Uh, Convenient plastic explosives that uh, GCPD had in storage and which were due for disposal. At the Gordon house, James and Sarah discuss the murders while Mao breaks back into the GCPD and steals a whole bunch of guns and a Humvee. Now that he is ready, Mao heads to the roof of the GCPD, turns on the back signal, and gets Commissioner Gordon to introduce him to Batman with the codename of Ballistic and Batman 2 begrudgingly agrees to his first proper team-up. Gordon, you wanted to see me? Actually, I didn't. Uh, Batman, I want Batman. I want you to meet... Uh, ballistic. Armed and dangerous. And melodramatic. Like you're not? Fair. With a little research, Jean-Paul finds a Wayne estate on the coast that would work for a trap. And I appreciate Jean Paul still having some quips as they head to the uh and off to chase the monster down. The next time Angon attacks, Batman and Ballistic intercept, get it to hang on to Ballistic's Humvee, and they drive it to the trap. They get into the manor, fight it through the building before blowing it, the mansion, and presumably Angon up. Afterwards, the two part ways. Batman is Gotham's protector, and Mal planning to become a meta human merc. Elsewhere, a fisherman pulls a mysterious woman out of the water. Angon, still very much alive. These issues are fine. Both characters conceptually could work for doing some of their own stories within the concept context of the DC universe, but not necessarily as a for their own standalone books. Joe Public as thus loosely established here but as this teacher who's trying to protect his students and dealing with crime that involves young people could work as a supporting character or frequent guest in like robin ballistic as an edgy hero for hire mercenary just in time for that concept to become vogue in the mid to late 90s could actually possibly end up working as his own book um possibly with, with frequent crossovers with other characters who end up working that sort of mercenary side of the dc universe like Deadshot, like Deathstroke, possibly even ending up crossing over or even guesting um, being a, a supporting character in the Suicide Squad. Like, actually, honestly, I'm surprised he hasn't shown up in the movies. I'm like legit shocked. Like, like this, like this feels like a kind of deep enough cut that I could see James, I could have seen James Gunn grabbing this guy for. Um, he is the Suicide Squad movie as an actual team member. Um, that said, of these concepts, again, Joe Public is like strong supporting character and energy, and he will come up again as a supporting character, but not leading character. Now, next time we're going to finish up Bloodlines 
or at least Batman's part of it. There are other parts going on with Superman and... Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 